dozens of students that are fleeing for safety. We have had reports of shots being fired inside the school. We do have some fatalities. Safety is not something new to us. Um, since the Columbine tragedy, um, in, I think it was 1999, um, we really began a focus on school safety. <laughs> When it comes to school safety and security, there are so many different factors that are involved. And we've looked at prior events uh, from learning experiences from Columbine all the way to Santa Fe uh, to see the best practices and lessons learned. When I became superintendent in 2012, number one priority was school safety. We've taken school safety and security very serious in Summit County. For the last three years, the Summit County Sheriff's Office has been ultimately responsible for school safety and security. The district um, supported my request for the past five years. First and foremost was to have an armed school resource officer at every school. In addition, we've done massive um, fencing projects, and we have an ongoing safety plan. We currently have a five-year plan looking forward um, for the next five years. Recently, the superintendent or I were approached by our Vito church basis and asked if we would be interested in partnering with them and local community to engage in improving our school safety. Without a doubt, what all of us have in common um, is the love and concern and safety of all of our children and all of our students. The additional resources that could come from this project would expedite the plan. So for example, the five-year plan could be cut down to four years or three years. We are going to use that money strategically for improving our cameras. Quality IP cameras plays a very, very vital role in our school safety package where we can proactively use that technology to ensure our school is safe. We want to move as quickly as possible to put every safety enhancement that we possibly can in our schools. Avito community, we want to invite you to this wonderful opportunity to help our Avito schools. I assure you, every penny that we raise for this initiative is going into our Avito community schools. Um, there are many ways that you can contribute. Um, certainly, you can participate in the golf tournament, or if you don't golf, like me, you can go straight to the website and make a donation. Um, every dollar that is raised will be used to enhance school safety in our schools. On behalf of the Simmel County Sheriff's Office, the Simmel County Public Schools, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your participation in this initiative. Round of applause for doing that. I mean, <clears throat> Chris Vasquez really put that together really well. Um, in all seriousness, uh, we're having a meeting tomorrow night, steering committee meeting again, and uh, you know things are progressing right along. But uh, our church was purposely, we asked them to leave our name out of it because this same video is going to be going to churches, uh, several churches all over the city uh, this morning. And uh, we are hoping, however, that we will be represented here, well represented, and uh, as we build relationships in the community. It's going for a great cause. We, we want it to succeed in every way. In fact, let me just say that um, our Christmas Eve offering, how many of you were here during Christmas Eve services? All right, a lot of you. Uh, you were here during the Christmas Eve, you know, our, our children took up the offering. Remember that? And uh, y'all had a great time with that. And uh, they actually took up, uh, doubled the highest offering I think we ever had on Christmas Eve. We, we received over $8,000 for secure Oviedo schools. And so, <clears throat> so they're going to be taking it up every morning. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we look forward to them doing it maybe again at Christmas Eve uh, next year. But we're going to have the, the steering committee meeting and everything brought together. So if you, play, if you play golf, you need to go on our website and sign up. It's going for a great cause. You're going to have a great time, build some relationships. If you don't play golf, uh, maybe your business can donate. I know somebody came to me uh, in between services and said their, their business, uh, she, she took the, the, the concept to her local business, and they are uh, being a hold sponsor at $250. And you say, well, that's a, a little bit higher than some tournaments. Well, we picked out a, a number where we can guarantee that if you give $250 to do a whole sponsorship, uh, that'll buy one camera, all right? So you're buying a camera for Oviedo High School, Haggerty High School, one of the middle schools, depending on how, how much money we can raise. And so uh, you need to be involved in that. But also the auction dinner that night, um, you know, you can come to dinner 
and um, you know, get some bargains on the auction if you would like. If you don't play golf, that's another way that you can be involved in that. But I, I encourage you to do that because our church has led the way so far, and we need to continue to lead uh, the way. Now, we are going to have that meeting tomorrow night. I moved it from 7 o'clock to 6.30. You know why? Yes, the, yeah, the football. The NCAA game, championship game, is on at 8 o'clock. Didn't want them to, to miss that. And uh, Alabama and Clemson are playing. Please, no applause. And, uh, and, you know, it doesn't matter to me who wins. Really, I don't have a dog <laughs> in that fight, you know. Uh, but what's interesting, Dabo Sweeney, the coach at Clemson, is known for having, being a Christian and, and uh, having a lot of Christians on his team. And uh, his quarterback, Trevor Lawrence, I've, I haven't been a big fan up to this point. He was from Cartersville, Georgia. He, he went over the state line, you know, to, to play football, so I wasn't too happy about the number one prospect in the whole country and losing it. But, uh, man, he is so laid back. You know, you think you're going to have to take those shocks, you know, wake him up in the morning. He is laid back, and they ask him the question, how can you go before such a big stage? I mean, you're 18 years old, uh, barely, out, barely out of high school. He's going to the senior prom, you know, uh, about a year ago. And so uh, uh, how, do you, how do you make it through so easily and just seem to, nothing really seems to phase you? He says, well, uh, I don't get my identity from being a quarterback in football. That's what he said. He said, I don't get my identity from football. I get my identity in Jesus Christ. And I thought to myself, you know, really, of all the people that I could, I could think of giving testimonies, um, boy, he really had a solid one because he understood really what was going on. It was just like, oh, I praise God for having all this great talent and all that. You know, I don't think God really cares that much who wins the game tomorrow night, you know? I don't think he has a dog in the fight either, you might say. You know, he just doesn't, that's not so much. But the greatest thing about doing anything that you do, whether it's in the business world, in the ministry, or on a football field, or a golf course, is that you can be so relaxed that you can play your best because it doesn't mean the world to you. But rather, Jesus means the world to you. And that's what he's saying. I get my identity in Jesus Christ. Now, many of you um, are making New Year's resolutions that have to do with your health, that have to do with maybe losing weight, that has to do with your family, has to do with discipline in your life, reading the Bible, maybe going to church, all kinds of resolutions. Let me share with you the number one resolution that's going to change your life more than any other thing. That is this, that you would realize who you are in Jesus Christ. Because in realizing that, the rest of life is put in perspective, and also you can build a life that matters. In fact, you're already mattering in, in, in the Lord. You're already making a difference. Our uh, mission statement in our church, if we can put that up on the screen, building lives that matter by leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, here's the good news. You're already there. You have more potential than what you're showing, and I do too, but you are already there. Here's how this passage is going to kind of work. We're going to see that how a person, through the Beatitudes, comes to know Christ, and then the change it makes in their life, the opposition that you're going to find, because you're out there and you're being that coming attraction. You are going out there into the world and really making a difference in life. You say, well, eh, I may not be making... You are a difference maker if you're a believer. Now, as we open to Matthew chapter 5, we've said that we're going to be going through the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to find out what it really means. It's the greatest sermon that's ever been preached, but also probably one of the most misunderstood. Now, I got a chance to preach, uh, as I say in the video uh, that uh, promoted this series, on the, the, the place where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. It's kind of sloped down. The, the elevation is probably no more than from where I am to uh, the floor, but it's kind of a gradual downward slope. And so Jesus was standing on this mount, and at first, the Bible says in verse 1, he was sitting down. But I believe that as people gathered around, I mean, chapter 4 has already told us that he's already performing miracles. People are following him. Uh, he's feeding people. I mean, all these things are happening in his life. And all these people are coming around, and so now he, he begins to stand up, and he preaches the rest of the message. And we look at Beatitudes, and we think to ourselves, yes, I'd like to have that one, I'd like to have this one. These are actually one package, and it describes a person of kingdom living, a victorious kind of living, and it has a natural progression 
in them. It talks in the first four about a change of heart. It talks about salvation. Then the next three talk about the results of that, then the persecution. And then finally, in verses 13 through 16, we call the similitudes. It talks about collectively what we are and what we mean in Christ. And so let's look at it. First of all, I want us to see. I want, remember, I've already said, you're already, making a, you're already a difference maker. Say that with me. I'm a dif- difference maker. Say it again. Okay, I believe a couple of you. So I got, my cha- I got a challenge here. I got a challenge. A change of heart. Look in verse 2. And he opened up his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit has nothing to do with financial stuff. <coughs> it has everything to do with the poverty in our heart, saying, look, there's something missing in my life. I'm spiritually poor. It's a humble statement. And a humble heart that says, there's something missing in my life, something of dissatisfaction, something is just not there, something I can't touch and reach for, but I, but I know that my life is not complete. Well, then you move to the next beatitude, and it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so here's the Holy Spirit of God is working on your heart. And you're thinking, you know, there's something missing in my life now. The next beatitude tells you what is missing and why it's missing. It's missing there because of sin. It's missing there because mainly of the sin of wanting to be the God of our own life, have ownership of our own life, but really the sins of our life as well. The Bible says, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. He talks here about mourning over something that is missing in our life. This is the deepest felt uh, agony of the heart. It's moving beyond the desperation of saying that something is wrong with my life and coming to the point of conviction to say, hey, I know what it is. The greatest thing that, I mean, the biggest obstacle to coming to know Christ, I can tell you from personal experience as well as counseling with others, is not an addiction necessarily. It's not this, it's not that, it's not all these other things. The main thing is I own me. You know, I'm not much, but I've got, I'm all I have. You ever heard that? Well, I'm not much, but I've all I've got. And so I call the shots in my own life. And we've seen this generation after generation in some form or another, even in the church, if I can just take this as the main example, even in the church, we have people that say, what can I do in order to feel good about God, maybe worship, maybe pray, maybe do some other things, rituals perhaps. What can I do to feel close to God without him owning my life, without me surrendering my heart? And here we find a person that is living in in conflict in his life because he knows I'm desperate, I'm unsatisfied with life, I know the reason. Well, number three gives us the next step. Look at the next beatitude. Blessed, it says, are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is controlled strength. It's not weakness, it's meekness. Now, we can get insight from this in the life of Moses. The Bible says Moses was the meekest man that ever lived. And you know, Moses, man, he had that, he had that staff. He was parting the Red Sea. He was doing all kinds of things, showing so much <coughs> power from God. And yet he was the meekest man that ever lived. How is that? Because meekness says, God, I'm taking my hands off my own life and I'm I'm surrendering to you. Controlled strength. God, I know something's wrong with my life. I know something's incomplete. There's a dissatisfaction in life. I'm mourning over that. I can't get rid of that. The the guilt and the incompleteness that I feel and the sin in my life, and there's something missing. And so, God, I'm taking my hands off my own life and I'm surrendering to you in meekness and humility. You've heard me maybe share the story with before about the missionary girl, true story, about how she uh, committed her life in high school, that she would go to uh, school, then go to seminary and study for the mission field. And she would go on the mission field, and the only thing she asked of God was to give her a husband before she left for the mission field. Well, she graduated from high school, went on to, to college, Graduated from college, went on to seminary, studied for the mission field, graduated from seminary, took the courses necessary in the language courses, and, and, and then she was ready to go. She was commissioned to go to the mission field. She was going to go the next day, 
but no husband. And she, she just broke down and cried and said, God, there's one thing that I ask of you. One thing. Just give me a husband because once I get on the mission field, there's not going to be too many candidates. And she became convicted in her own heart. And she says, you know, I've never surrendered my life. I've, I've, never, I've never taken my hands off my life. There's always something there that I said, God, I will if. I will if. Now, if she had not taken her hands off her life, what about me? Oh, my goodness. What about me? When you and I come to know Christ, that's what's happening in our life. We are taking on a new Lord in our life. Why would we do that? Why, why in the world would I surrender my heart and take my hands off my own life? Well, you know, you can think of a lot of reasons. The Holy Spirit is drawing you to salvation. It's a matter of trust. I trust you with my life now, God. I'm giving you my life because I trust. But there's another reason, and that happens in the next beatitude. In verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. I've already said the second beatitude has to do, first beatitude, totally with dissatisfaction. The second one, the reason for it. Now we come to the fourth one, and we find out that we are going to be satisfied if what? We, we hunger and thirst after righteousness. Here's something that we haven't maybe often thought of. Deep within our heart, there's a need to be perfect. You've heard people say, well, they're just a perfectionist. Well, they outwardly show, by some neuroses or whatever, perfectionism. But deep down within our own heart, we all desire to be perfect. In fact, we, we sort of have a feeling in our heart that we ought to be. I mean, have, how many, have you ever said, well, nobody's perfect? I'm trying to excuse, of course, what you've done. Besides, well, I was just raising my hand just to encourage y'all. I mean, I've never said that. No, I mean, some of you wouldn't vote for anything. I'm not going to call you up here. No camera's going to shine on you, nothing like that, all right? How many have ever said that? Nobody's perfect. Raise your hand. All right, okay, I've got your attention. Now you can go back to sleep. Now, um, <laughs> sure, people have said that. You know, there's people, and when you think about it, you know somebody just like this. If you were to say to them, hey, um, do you believe that you're a sinner? They would say, oh, yeah, certainly. The Bible says so, and yeah. Okay, name one. And they can't name one. They can't name one time that they've sinned. And it's not that they would have, oh, I know, I've sinned every day. Okay, name one. They can't name one because they've never come to grips with the fact that they're not perfect. And oftentimes, they're the type of people that expect everybody else to be perfect. Boy, if they're not perfect, you get offended because you're kind of perfect. We have a need in our heart to be perfect perfect. But we don't have that perfection. We just don't. Jesus said at the end of this chapter, and we'll go over this next week, be perfect as my Father in heaven is also perfect. And so just to give you a little insight about that, one of the things that Matthew was doing here, of course, was bridging the gap between the Old and New Testament. And that's the reason why we misunderstand the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount so much. Uh, we think the Sermon on the Mount, well, i gotta, I got to live by this stuff. You know, cut off my hand and put out my eye if I sin. What was he doing? He was dealing with the sin of his day. Now, you and I wonder why Jesus doesn't say anything about this sin or this sin of our day. Things that are, are, are horrible maybe in, in our day. Why, why does he say anything about that? Because that was not his goal in life was not to point out everybody and, and just list the sin. Okay, here's a list of the sins. You've got to look in the Old Testament for that. Jesus confronted the sins of his day, just like Paul did, just like John did. Everybody, as they wrote the New Testament, would, would confront issues that they were about in that day. It was within the culture. It was in that church, maybe, that they were writing to. So what was the sin that Jesus was attacking, confronting? It was self-righteousness. It wasn't hypocrisy. That was a sidebar issue with the Pharisees. But remember how the Pharisees were. They had that need for perfection. They were making up, they were trying to obey every single law. Oh, I've obeyed every law. Boy, I've never sinned. 
Not only that, but, but, but I haven't sinned all these other things that I've made up too. You know, all these, all these rules and regulations to help me feel better. I haven't broken those either. And people looked up to them and said, those are the righteous people. Well, I wish I could be like the Pharisees. Jesus told the Jewish audience there in the book of Matthew, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will likewise perish. One of the key verses in the New Testament. You see, the Jewish people, because of Abraham, they were born from, they were in Abraham, they were born from Abraham. They began over the centuries to teach that because they're in Abraham, God's taking care of them. And Jesus was simply saying, look, I'm going to introduce the church to you, and I'm going to the cross and dying for the sins of the whole world. That would have been so abrupt to a Jewish audience. So Matthew was bringing them along, giving them examples in the first few chapters, and now sharing with them kingdom life. This is how, this is how a king's kid should live. And this is what happens. You hunger. You thirst after what? Somebody else's righteousness. In just a few weeks, we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 6. And in that key verse in Matthew chapter 6, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom is God's rule in our life. Taking everybody else off the throne, putting Jesus on the throne. His character is his righteousness. It's his righteousness. Because the moment that you and I receive Jesus into our heart, our, our soul is satisfied because the Holy Spirit comes in and imputes, that's a theological term, it means to put in, he puts in the righteousness of Jesus Christ in our heart. And that's why we're satisfied. We know, hey, I'm not perfect by myself, but hey, I'm perfect in Christ. I'm in Christ. That's who I belong to. That, that's who I worship. That's who's first place in my life. That's, that's how he really makes the difference. And as long as I please him, it doesn't make that much difference who else I please. And so we look at this and we say, well, what's the results of that? Well, there are some results. G, uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's begun. Something brand new. A new heart within us. David said in Psalm 51, create in me, Lord, a clean heart. He used a specific Greek, Hebrew word, rather, in that passage. There were two Hebrew words for create. One was to create something out of nothing. That's when God said, let there be light. The others create something out of previously existing substance. That's when he took dust or dirt from the ground and made man. This is the word he used in Psalm 51 to create something out of nothing. We had no, no righteousness of our own. We had no clean heart of our own. God has placed within us his righteousness. So what does that mean? Well, it means we have a changed life on the outside. That's the reason why we're, we're trying to teach an attractional ministry by sending you out into the world and people look at you and say, wow, there's something different about your life. That, that Christian stuff must work. Because look in verse 7. It says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, merciful, as one man um, defined it, to be moved with empathy, to alleviate someone else's suffering, even at your own cost. Now, listen to that last part, even at your own cost. That reminds me of giving, but also forgiveness. So let's take forgiveness, giving another day. Forgiveness, it costs you something. There's a parable in Matthew 18 about the parable, called the parable of the talents. And what happened was a man can't, comes before, it's a fictitious story, of course, as Jesus just told an illustration. He said a man comes before his master owing 10,000 talents, and he begs him. He said, please, please let it go. Please forgive me. Please give me another shot. Please give me another shot. And so he looks at him and says, oh, okay, I'll, I'll give you another shot. I'll forgive you, in fact, of the 10,000 talents. So the man goes out, and a man, somebody else owes him like 100 denarii, which is a very small amount compared to 10,000 talents. And he said, look, you know, you haven't paid me yet. The man says, look, if you just give me another couple of days, I'll come up with money. He said, nope, time's up. And he casts him into prison. 
Well, the master heard about that, called his subject in. He said, look, I forgave you of a lot, 10,000 talents, and you couldn't do the same to this little guy over here? You see, because we've been forgiven a lot, not only as example by Jesus, but the freedom that we have in Christ that we're able to forgive others. But why can't we do that? Why? Have you wondered that? He said, yeah, that's what I ought to do. I ought to forgive because Jesus has given, forgiven me of all these sins, even though maybe you can't name one. <laughs> you know, but God, Jesus has forgiven me of all these sins. I ought to forgive somebody of their sin against me. Now, why don't we do that? Because forgiveness costs you something. It always does. Now, I'm not talking about dismissal. You know, something happens and you ah, don't worry about every, every politician or every football coach or every church man. I mean, you know, we all do that kind of stuff. I'm not worried about that. That's dismissing of a sin. I'm talking about you've been hurt. And to forgive that sin against you is costly. Let me give you an example. Suppose somebody borrowed some money from you, and maybe they borrowed uh, $5,000. And you needed that $5,000. You took it out of your savings, and you think, wow, this is putting my savings account very low. I don't have anything to fall back on, but my friend really, really needs this. So you give him the $5,000, no interest. Just pay me back when you can. And uh, maybe, you know, if you can make it in the next three or four months, that'll be great. Three or four months pass by, you don't hear a word from him. He never mentions it. Six months passes by. Finally, you have to go to him and say, look, I need my 5000 He says, hey, look, I just can't pay you. I lost all that money. You know, I, I lost it all. I invested it and lost it all. And I don't know what to say. I just, I, I'll never be able to come up with that kind of money. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just flat broke. And you say, hey, you know, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Really, I forgive you. Just go on. Start from scratch. Now, you'll never let him borrow money again, but we'll start from scratch. And uh, you say, wow, that's good. That money just goes away. It doesn't cost anybody anything, right? No. It doesn't cost the guy that lost your money anything at all, but it costs you $5,000. It costs you something to forgive. You forgive someone, it costs you, I don't know, maybe your pride. It, 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 you forgive someone, it costs you, you think, your standards of some type. You forgive someone, and you have to pay the price. And Jesus on the cross was a perfect example. Forgiveness is costly. And he gave us that example. He didn't die on the cross for an example, but he, the cross is an example, nevertheless. And in that, as we look at this, this uh, into the Scripture, we will find out that it was not only costly to him, but the depth of the cost. You know, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and the Bible says he, is, he had great drops of sweat opening up like great drops of blood. Now, I don't know whether that was real blood or not. Some people believe that it was, and they have good physiological definition of how that could happen. All I know is like it, it he was in agony. Lord, if this cup could pass from me, Father, please let it pass. The depth of it. And what about the intensity of it? You think about when he died on the cross and the blood coming from his hands and his feet and the pain that he was, that racked through his body. But boy, there was something else. He cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, the depth of that, the intensity of that. At that point, Jesus took on your sins and mine and the father, his father, turned his back on him. He abandoned him. You say, well, how do you get that? Well, let me tell you what it means in the Greek. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? That's exactly what it means. He turned his back on him. He had to because the Bible says he cannot, the father cannot look upon the sin of anyone. Now, think about that for just a moment. Think about it. If my, if one of our, our members here came up after the service and said, Pastor, I don't love you anymore, I don't like you anymore, and uh, I'm out of here, and you'll never see me again. Well, let me tell you something. That, that would break my heart. You know, I, I'm, I'm just glad you waited until after the service to do that because it would have been hard for me to preach, you know, through all that. But if my son or one of my sons or daughter came up 
and said, Dad, I don't love you anymore, don't like you anymore, um, you'll never see me again. That would just tear my heart completely apart. But let me take you a little deeper, some of the things that you've been through perhaps. If my wife, Pam, were to come up to me and say, I don't love you anymore, I don't like you anymore, I'm out of here. You'll never see me again. That would be just totally devastating. That would be the worst. Now think about it for just a moment. We've been together 38 years. And the closer the relationship, the more duration of the relationship, the greater the hurt. But can you imagine Jesus and the Father being together for all of eternity? All eternity past. And for the first time in all of eternity, the Father says, I'm abandoning you. I'm leaving you to die on the cross alone. The intensity. But listen, you can talk about the Jews doing something or the Romans doing something. Let me tell you what I read in the Bible many, many times. Jesus said, I didn't, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. To give my life. The Bible says he did not, that his life was not taken from him. He gave it willingly on the cross. All these others, that things that God worked out for the circumstances to hang him on the cross, he went willingly to die on the cross for our sins. It was costly. Listen, we can talk about mercy. But if you don't have mercy, resentment and bitterness will find a home in your heart. Now, notice there's a change here. Can you, can you think about going out into the world and being forgiving? Forgiving, I'm not talking about just the easy stuff that you're dismissing. I'm talking about the stuff, hey, you've been hurt, and, and you've been you've forgiven. But then, notice something else. There's another change in, in the life. In verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Isn't that what we want out of life? We just want to see God. We want to see God in everything, everything that's going on. Now, the heart is mentioned 960-something times in the Bible, and it talks about the causal core, as Tim Keller would say, the causal core of our inner being. It's really the foundation. It's where everything begins. It's the floor of everything. It's not just our emotions. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep the heart with all diligence, for from it flow the issues of life, or the springs of life. The issues, every issue you have in life, it flows from the heart. And God has created a new heart in you. And he says, I, you know, coming to Christ means that you purify your heart. Now, you think to yourself, there's no way I can be perfect. That's not really what it's talking about. The word purity here means to be unmixed. It, it means to not have anything else, not, not double-minded, the way James 1 says, being double-minded in all of your ways, you're unstable. In the Old Testament... This had to do with idolatry. And you've purified yourself from idols. In other words, you, you said, I've conquered the idol. I know what the idols are in my life. And I'm either, either in the midst of conquering them and struggling with that, or I've conquered the idols of my life. And Jesus sits on the throne of my life. That's a pure heart. So what happens here? Well, you go out into the world hungering and thirsting after righteousness and showing a change in life by forgiving people and giving to people and, and having a pure heart. And they see a difference in your life. It's not a judgmental heart. It's, it's a changed heart. It's a new heart. Somebody's going to get mad about that, particularly when you go to the next beatitude. It says in verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, I think all of us want peace in the world. But what it's specifically talking about here is that you become a peacemaker between other people and God. 2 Corinthians tells us, For this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It's because we are influencing people for the cause of Christ. People see a difference in what we're doing and how we're living in life, and they think, well, you know, there is hope. There must be hope. There's a coming attraction there. I think I'm going to go see the movie. There's a coming attraction there. I think I'm going to come to church and find out a little bit more about it. And Satan hates this. And so it brings me to my third thing, and that is, and I'm going to look over these last two very quickly, a change in opposition. You've changed teams. You used to be in the world and of the world, and now you've come out of that, and your heart has been changed. You've got a whole new heart. You're living in a different way. That's going to make you, you become dangerous to the devil. 
And there's always going to be some opposition. And we see this even further when we look at our last point today, and that is a change of mission. Before, maybe you were part of the problem in, in a way. I mean, you were kind of like, you know, I was me. I mean, I was out for myself, even though I didn't want to admit it. Even when I did something really nice and kind and benevolent, it was to make myself feel better. And so you've come out of that world. And now you're living for another way. It says this, you are the salt of the earth, Jesus said. Now, he didn't say, I want to make you salt of the earth. I want to develop you and disciple you into becoming salt of the earth. He just made an emphatic statement. As a church body together, this is all, he's talking about people together. He's talking about people in the, right there in front of him, his disciples. Everybody else is overhearing the thing, but he's looking right at his disciples when he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt lost its taste. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Look at verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Now you're light. Now you're salt and you're also light. Salt in Old Testament times and New Testament times as well was very, very valuable. It was a preservative. They didn't have refrigeration back then, so it was the pres preservative. It's also put taste into things just like it does today for us. And so what it's saying is, look, you're you add, you add flavor to the world. But he says also, and this is the main point, you're the preservative of the world. All that persecution that goes on, all the, the negativity toward the church and toward maybe you particularly at school or at work, you can say, look, I, to yourself, I know what's going on all around me, and I know that a lot of my ideas are rejected, but I, I preserve this world. Remember what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. God says, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save the city. He finally made a deal and, uh, with Abraham. And he says, I'll save the city if I can find 10 righteous people. Well, he couldn't find them. Well, he can find them here because we have the righteousness of Christ. So we are the preservative to the rest of the world. Then there's a light. There's no electricity back then. Even candle lighting was man-made light. And um, it, it was dark. It was dim. And darkness will give you delirium. We, Pam and I, when we were on our um, trip to Alaska last spring, we talked to a lot of people and said, yeah, we, we live here during the spring and the summer, but boy, we go back in the fall. One, one lady that was a guide for us said, yeah, I lived here for six years, year round, and I just about lost it. There's darkness all day and all night long through several months out of the year. Couldn't stand it. Had to leave. And many of the people there do that. And so what do we know from this? First of all, there is a need for salt and light in the world because this world is tasteless, this world is decaying, this world is broken. And yet they can't see the truth. They just can't see it. It's broken. You can see human brokenness. You can see family brokenness. You can see lives torn apart. You can see terrorism in our world today. You can see shootings in the schools. Even simple things like flowers and grass, they all die. Humans die. We're all dying. We need a salt and light in the world. Second thing in this passage, realize that Jesus is that salt and light. He even says in John 8, Jesus spoke to them saying, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I know you, you think to yourself, well, it's ridiculous to think I'm the preservative of the world. No, it, it's really not, if you really know the truth. You say, well, how do you know the truth? Well, you come into the light. You know, if we were to blacken out this entire uh, auditorium, no light at all. I mean, we're even talking about your cell phones being off. Um, anyway, uh, your cell phones being off, everything's off. Okay, let's not do that, really. <laughs> I got kind of scared there. <clears throat> we did pay the electric bill, by the way. Um, if we were to blacken out everything, you, you couldn't see anything. Now, if we turned on one light, you say, oh, I see that light. But then I see some other things, too. I see some other people down here because I see the light. It's right over their head. And all of a sudden, all the lights come on. You say, I can see everything. You see, it's not only that you see the light, but the light causes you to see everything else. You say, well, look, I, I have professors at UCF and 
FSU, University of Florida, maybe some of you go to Harvard, Yale. I mean, you, you really have the great professors and well, well-trained. Man, they're PhDs. They know so much more than I do. And, and they just scoff at this Christianity stuff. Now, not all of them do. Let's just say some of them do by argue, for just argument's sake. He said, you know, they don't believe the Bible's true and they believe this and archaic things and, and they've studied the Babylonians and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, real smart people also have studied all this and believe it all. And so where do you go? You see, the problem is they, they have these candles and they have their own light and they have their bias because of what has been taught them, now they're teaching to others. And somewhere along the line, somebody just took a stab in the dark. Natural light. Well, you can see that a lot better than you can artificial light. I remember um, when I was pastoring my last church, and um, I, I bought these shoes, and I, I really liked them. They had these artificial bottoms. Now, most of them have those kind of things back then. These Florsheim shoes, and they, they just didn't make them anywhere else uh, but besides this. And they're very comfortable, not very expensive. And so I bought two pair. I'm tired of my feet hurting, you know, so I bought two pair. One black, one quarterman pair. And um, one day, I was sitting across the... The, um, in my office from one of our denominational workers, a guy I really didn't know very well, much older than me, more experienced than me, and he was sitting there, and he was kind of smirking when I was talking. And I thought, man, he's just not taking me seriously. I know I was in my 30s, early 30s, looked younger than that. I said, he's just not taking me seriously. I crossed my legs one way, crossed him another, and I just kept talking to him. And uh, finally, I, I was just going to say something real profound just to, to wipe that smirk off his face. You know, I stretched out my legs, crossed them a little bit, and I suddenly realized I had one black shoe on and one quarterman shoe on. And I could tell what he was laughing at. Now, the funny thing about the whole thing, I never mentioned it and he never mentioned it. You know, we just let it go. But what happened? Well, I, I had a 40 degree, I mean, four, 40 watt light bulb, I think, in my closet. Couldn't hardly see anything, putting on shoes real fast. I was going by artificial light. You know that you'll even buy something in the store and it looks one color. You get out in the sun, it looks a different color. Our artificial light will always fool you. Jesus is the light of the world, and he will not only help you see him, but he'll help you see everything else. Now, here's the last thing to this passage, and that is this. If you receive Jesus into your heart, you become the light of the world. He says uh, in verse 15, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. How in the world do you get the light of Christ? You ha you're a lamp. I'm a lamp. I have to be lit. And Jesus Christ has lit that in your heart. He's lit the fire of God in your heart. And so you see, it's not that, well, what I want to do is preach to you this morning, teach you this morning, that you can become salt if you're a Christian. No, Jesus already, that's above my pay grade. He's already said, you are the salt. Well, you can become light. No, Jesus said, you're already the light, a city set upon a hill. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, I'm just not that great of a testimony. I'm not that, I'm not that good of attraction out into the world. Notice what it says in verse 13. He says, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how is its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. How do you get salty again? God's got to do something in your life. Some repentance involved in life and forgiveness and coming back to him and say, God, help, my, help, help me become salty. It's really salty again. And what about the light? He said, nobody sets it under a bushel or a lampstand. He says, he says, but what happens is when your light shines, verse 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to, the, uh, to your Father who is in heaven. He says, light your lamp and, and you'll become not only the light of the world, but, but potentially a greater fire. And other people are going to see your good works and glorify God. And how are they going to glorify God but surrender to him and taking their hands off their own life just like you have? So do you know who you are? One philosopher said, hey, I know God doesn't exist, but I got this question and this question, and life is futile, and there's no answers, and there's no God, there's no answers, but I know there's no God, and my, my wife and I just can't live this way. He says, it's as though we don't know who we are. 
Do you know who you are? As a believer, you are in Christ, and you were made for this. You were made to be salt and light of the earth. Like the old movie about the piano player, and uh, he plays the piano, but he gets mugged one night. He goes into a coma. This was in this movie, and he was in a coma, and he, he woke up uh, weeks later with amnesia. And there's always amnesia, you know, the old black and white movies. And so uh, every time he walks by a piano, he's fearful. I mean, he's got these subconscious memories about being attacked. But he's also drawn to the piano. So one day he finally finds the courage, and he sits down and begins to play a little bit. And within minutes, he's playing like the concert pianist he was born to be. I know some of you here are sitting there, and you're thinking, because of past memories of things that didn't go well, prayers that weren't answered, things that didn't go right maybe at church or in your life, every time you pass by a church, every time you open up the Bible, every time you think about coming to know Christ, it's fearful. What am I going to have to give up? What am I going to have to do? But in every case, really, every case, it's a true, authentic decision for Christ. It's like getting, sitting down at that piano, and then you say, wow, I see it now. I was born for this. You're born for this. Salt and light. A city set on a hill. That's what this church was born for as a group together. Wouldn't you like to become one of those people? Wouldn't you like to be part of the answer instead of maybe part of the problem? Wouldn't you like to know the answers to life? Wouldn't you like to see the rest of life and see God and see the rest of the world like God sees the world because of the light that's been shining? Wouldn't you like to be the preservative of the earth? Even when all the persecution goes on, even when everybody is, seems like they're against you, you just think silently to yourself, thank God I'm here because they might be dead if I wasn't, I wasn't here. The world may not be here if I wasn't here. And then you can shed light, the light of Christ on their life when they are in the pits of darkness. Wouldn't you like to become that kind of person? If so, you can. And I want to invite you here in just a moment to pray with me to receive Christ into your life, into your heart, to create that new heart in you, to give the, the righteousness of Christ in your heart so you can be identified with Christ That'll change your life, to know who you are. Let's bow in prayer. As we get our hearts quiet before the Lord, if that's the prayer of your heart, if you'd like to join with God, join with Christ, and receive him into your life and his righteousness, his identity, would you pray this prayer with me right now as I pray aloud? Lord God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for going to the cross and dying for my sins. I open up my heart and life. I invite you to come in. I pray the Holy Spirit would come into my heart and create a new heart within me. And I would see my identity not as a student, not as an engineer, not as a lawyer, not as a housewife, not as a mother, not as a dad, not as a real estate agent, not as an insurance agent. I'd see my identity as a child of God. I'd see my identity in Jesus. And I'll pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.